My name is Li Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. We are in the middle of our Sima Qian series. Next week, we are going to look at one of Sima Qian's most famous works, The Letter to Renan Shu. Last week, we looked at Sima Qian's discussion of the Nanyue Kingdom, that state that lasted from around 200 BC to 111 BC. This week, we are looking at an equally important chapter in Sima Qian's work. Like most of Sima Qian's writing, this is taken from the Shiji, the records of the grand historian. Sima Qian, just a refresher, was born in 145 BC. We don't know when he died, probably sometime around 90 BC. Again, the exact date is still debated, but he stopped writing stuff around 90 BC, so we think he may have died then or shortly thereafter. Sima Qin is China's first real historian before some Chinese folks had written stuff down about the past, but Sima Qin is the first person to really write history that is a mostly true account of stuff that happened in the past. The Shiji, the records of the grand historian, is divided into chapters where Sima Qin discusses a particular topic. Sometimes those are individual people, so it's basically a biography, what you would get in Plutarch. But sometimes we have groups of people that chapters are built, are built around. That's what we're looking at today. And sometimes he writes a chapter just on random things, like a particular kind of sacrifice. Today, we are looking at Sima Qian's chapter called The Biography of the Capitalist. The Chinese is Huo Zhe Lie Zhuan. It's the 129th chapter in the records of the historian. This is sometimes translated as the biography of the movers of goods or the biography of the money makers. I think capitalist works best, both because the chapter itself is this Adam Smithian argument for free market capitalism. Some scholars might quibble with that use of the term capitalism, but I think it pretty much works. I'm not 100% convinced it's the right word, but I think it's probably the best word we have right now to describe what Sima Qin is doing in this chapter. But the term capitalist works also because this chapter is a series of biographies of these men who move goods around China under those forces of the free market. Lots of people who talk about China assume that China throughout its entire history, they assume that the Chinese government exercised a lot of control over the economy. Some of this comes from Max Weber, the famous German sociologist. Some of this comes from Adam Smith himself. He kind of constructs this idea of China as always having the state that has a deep hand in the economy. But in fact, both Weber and Smith are pretty much wrong in their depiction of China. For most of imperial China's 2,000-year-long history, the state actually tended to stay out of the management of, of the economy more often than it got deeply involved. Of course, China has this long history, so it went back and forth depending on what time period we're talking about, depending on who is in charge. But for most of China's history, if you were to take a time machine back and interview a Confucian scholar managing the economy and ask him what makes for a good economic policy, what makes for good economic management. Most of them would say low taxes on the people, low government spending, and little government involvement in the economy. So Ma Qin's biography of the capitalist is really where that consensus begins in Chinese history. The beginning of the chapter is the clearest statement in support of free markets ever made in Chinese history. I'm just going to read out my translation of that particular paragraph in the records of the historian, just so y'all get a flavor for what Sima Qin is arguing. Quote, All the people around the center of the country have what they want, the stuff that is traditional, the bedding, the clothes that one wears, drinks and food, the things necessary for a good life, the instruments necessary for a good burial. Thus, those who rely on farming produce food, the hunters hunt meat, the workers build things, the merchants move things to the market. And what government is commanding and sending out orders to coordinate these things meeting up? In fact, each individual works at what he can do, exhausting his strength and getting what he desires. In this way, when products are cheap, they are drawn to where those products are expensive. When products are expensive, they are drawn to where they are cheap. Each individual works hard at his own vocation, and each does what makes him happy. Is this not like water flowing downward? Day and night, nonstop, no one commands it, and yet it comes. No one seeks it, yet the people produce it. How is this not the fitting together of the way, the Tao? Does this not mean that 
the movement of products is the natural experience. What this statement is talking about is how freely goods are circulating in Han Dynasty China. If you want something and you live in the center of the country, that is, in the central plains or there around the capital, markets are there to provide for you anything you desire. You want meat, hunters are hunting it. You want bedding, you want clothes, food, drink, everything you need to live a good life, everything you need to die a good death. All of those things can be had in this system. Then Sima Chen goes and explains how this all works. He points out that there is no government that moves these things around with a command. It's not uh, government, but instead it's the price mechanism. When products are cheap, they tend to move to those places where those products are expensive. When products are expensive, they tend to move to where they are cheap. In other words, there's a supply and demand function here. In a different part of the same chapter, Sima Chen says, Jostling and joyous, the whole world comes after profit. Racing and rioting after profit, the whole world goes. So Sima Chen's argument is that these things move around China because of the profit mechanism, because people want to make money. In that passage that I quoted earlier, the the long passage where he talks about goods moving being as natural as water flowing, there's also this line, each individual works hard at his vocation, each doing what makes him happy. There's the sense in Sima Chen that he's talking about the specialization of trade that occurs in markets. This is just one sentence, so it's super, super basic. You can't read too much into it. But still, I think he's hinting that he understands things that are pretty fundamental to our understanding of free markets at this stage. And keep in mind, I mean, he's writing 21 centuries before today. Even if what he says is very basic, it's interesting that he's hit on some of the the important points of, of how markets work. Finally, at the end of that long portion that I quoted, you have this famous metaphor of Sima Chen. He, he compares goods moving around the country as if they are like water flowing downwards, as if this movement of products is entirely natural. No one says that this must happen, yet still it happens. If Adam Smith had the invisible hand, Sima Chen has the flowing stream. Both are metaphors for how markets work to move things around almost naturally. For Sima Chen and Smith, that understanding of nature. And Sima Chen is using the word Tao. That's the Tao of Taoism. He's suggesting that there's a, a track, a path, a, a way. Sima Chen's father is very closely associated with the school of Taoism, not, not the religion, but the philosophical school of Taoism. Sima Chen is clearly using this metaphor of the Tao being of markets functioning kind of like the Tao in a very precise way. That paragraph that I read, it's the clearest example of a free market statement made in Chinese history. And coming from China's first historian, it had a pretty profound influence on Chinese culture. One of my teachers in Taiwan, she suggested that this chapter, the biography of the capitalist, the Huo Lie Juan, it was the main reason that Chinese folks who go abroad are so good at business. Everywhere Hua Chao, the, the overseas Chinese folks go, they end up opening lots of businesses. Of course, that's purely her speculation. It doesn't really prove anything. In fact, I'm very skeptical of that. But it's an interesting thought nonetheless, just because you have this long history of folks reading Sima Qin. Sima Qin is very highly regarded throughout much of Chinese history. Okay, so that first paragraph, the, the part that I read, that's the most famous part of this chapter. The rest of this chapter is a collection of short biographies of different capitalists, people who are moving goods around China for profit. Zigong is one of these capitalists, these movers of goods. Zigong is the artistic name or the rap name, whatever you want to call it, of a person whose birth name is Duan Mu Tzu, but he's more famous as Zigong. He's one of the 70 disciples of Confucius. He becomes a bureaucrat for the county of Wei, and there he becomes a merchant at the same time that he's a bureaucrat. He's moving goods around from Wei to different places in China, and he becomes the richest of Confucius's disciples. He uses those riches to help spread the name of, and it's implied, the philosophy of Confucius throughout all the world. He says, throughout Tian Sha, all under heaven. 
the point of this passage, at least as I interpret it, it seems to be trying to give a good name to these merchants. In Confucianism, merchants historically have been regarded skeptically. That is, Confucians tend to look down on merchants. I'm not sure how true that was at the time Sima Chen is writing, but I know later on in Imperial China and the Song Dynasty and the, the Qing Dynasty, that's definitely true. And I imagine it's probably true in the Han Dynasty, but I'm not 100% certain of that. What Sima Chen seems to be trying to do is he seems to be trying to say, look, you Confucians think that merchants aren't good Confucians, but actually Zigong, one of Confucius's most famous disciples, is himself a merchant, a capitalist, one of these guys who moves goods around the empire. And in fact, he is the reason Confucius is famous, because he used the wealth that he got from his economic activity, and he used it to underwrite the proselytizing of Confucianism. Other individuals that Sima Qin writes about in this biography of the capitalist Yi Dun and Guo Zong. Yi Dun makes his money by manufacturing salt. Guo Zong makes his money from the iron smelting business. Here's the line from Sima Qin. Yi Dun used the salt pools to rise up, and Guo Zong of Handan made a business out of smelting iron and both were as rich as kings. This is actually a pretty interesting passage. It may not look like it on the surface, but it's really interesting. We're going to talk about this a little bit more in the next episode, but Sima Qin did not apparently get along with his emperor. One of the reasons seems to be that Sima Qin was very much opposed to his emperor, Han Wu Di, or Emperor Han. Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty creates these government monopolies in Han Dynasty China's high-tech sectors, that is salt making and iron smelting. You might not think of those as super high-tech, but during the Han Dynasty, those were very high-tech manufacturing industries. Emperor Wu has the government take those over, and Sima Qin thinks this is a big problem, and he's very critical of Han Wu Di for that. So what Sima Qin seems to be doing here is he seems to be citing the examples of Yi Dun in the salt industry and Guo Zong in the iron industry to say, hey, Han Wu Di, you know, this is, this is kind of what you destroyed. It's done very obliquely, and the reason f- for that is because Emperor Wu does not take kindly to criticism. We'll talk about that more in the next episode. I'm already starting to talk about the next episode, which means I should probably end this episode. I think y'all get the idea. So my chin has this very short argument that almost sounds like Adam Smith. He places this argument about free markets at the beginning of this chapter, and he argues that free markets are the natural state of man, that good should move via the price mechanism, like water drifting down a slope. Then Sima Chen goes through this list of merchants. He describes them. He tells their stories. But he does so in a way that may have been criticism of Emperor Wu's economic policies. We'll talk more about the conflict between Sima Chen and Emperor Wu on the next episode. Until then, this week's Cheng Yu is not from Sima Chen. It's from the Zhang Guozi, another famous text from that period. I just encountered it this week and I wanted to share it with y'all. It literally means something like the shaft of the cart is going southwards. The tracks of the wheel are going north. Metaphorically, it means doing something at cross purposes to the point where these two sides are doing is self-defeating. Sort of the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing and therefore they're undercutting each other. This can refer to either an individual undercutting their goals with their own actions or it can refer to a group of people who are at cross purposes. Like I said, it comes from the Zhang Guozi, written by Liu Shang, a guy who was born about a decade after Sima Qin died. Okay, that's it for me in this week's podcast. If y'all have any thoughts on the podcast, please send me an email, chineseliteraturepodcast at gmail.com. I am slow to respond, but I do respond to emails eventually. If you want to show your love for the podcast in a more tangible form, please find the podcast on Patreon, Chinese Literature Podcast at patreon.com. My name is Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.